So welcome back. I'm going to be talking about two issues that relate to input in a microcontroller or microprocessor. And this is where you have mechanical buttons or keys connected up to a processor. Now the two issues specifically are first of all when you have many keys and not enough pins and secondly when you have keys or mechanical contacts that are connected to a microprocessor and those mechanical contacts cause something called signal bounce. So we'll look at these in turn. Now first of all, if you have multiple pins um, on a microprocessor dedicated to GPIO port, you don't want to use them up in an arrangement where you have one GPIO pin connected to each button on a keypad. Even if you have a keypad like the one shown here, which has got 12 keys, that's, that's 12 pins on your microprocessor. If you had a, a keyboard, like a QWERTY keyboard on a PC with over 100 pins, that would be more than 100 pins on your microprocessor. You'd be running out of pins on the package on your CPU. There's much more efficient ways to doing that. And I think one of the most common is this uh, matrix keyboard scanning system. And we're going to take a little look about that on this, uh, this 12 key um, button pressing device. So the 12 keys uh, shown here are arranged in 3 times 4. So there are 4 rows and 3 columns. It's shown on the right hand side of the screen. The 3 rows containing the buttons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, star, 0 and hash respectively, and the columns shown here. And as we see um, below the, the picture of the device, the uh, arrangement in rows and columns is actually adopted by the internal wiring. Okay? And because we wire it up in this way, where each switch shorts between two wires, we can see there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wires. If we can connect that to a microprocessor, it only actually needs seven pins on the microprocessor to control 12 pins on a keypad. And in general, when we have a um, keypad with the N pins, we only need two root N. Sorry, we have a keypad with N buttons, we only need two root N IO pins to do this. And in the diagram that uh, um, has been put down here, we can see that uh, one button, the, the four has been pressed, and if button four presses, it shorts together the uh, row seven and the column three. On the other hand, if the nine button is pressed, it shorts together the row six and the column five. So that's logical, right? Let's see how we need to wire that up to actually use it. And it's shown on the right hand side where we have our microcontroller just here with a CPU connected to its um, GPIO port. We have one port here and we're only using seven pins in that port. Three of those pins we've got connected as inputs. Four of those pins we've got connected as outputs. And the output pins are connected to the rows of the keypad. The input pins are connected to the columns of the keypad. Okay. Now let's just um, read through what it says here. It says when the output pattern is 1, 1, 1, 1 binary, that means 1, 1, 1, 1 on port pins 3, 4, 5 and 6, and if we press key 1, it results in an input pattern on the, the three lower bits of 0, 0, 1 binary. If we press 2, then the input pattern will be 0, 1, 0. If we press 3, it would be 1, 0, 0. Okay. If we were to press um, button 4, well, we would get the same input as if we pressed button 1. If we press button 7, we get the same input as pressing buttons 4 and button 1. So this is great. We can identify which column somebody is pressing a button in but we can't necessarily identify which row. So the way we do that is that we scan the row identifiers, so the row outputs, we scan them rapidly. 
Okay, so instead of outputting one, 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 one on our rows, we output zero, 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 one, and we check. Then we output zero, zero, one, zero, and we check. Then we output zero, one, zero, zero, we check. Then we output one, zero, 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 and we check. And then we repeat back again in sequence. How do we check? Well, we look at those three input pins. Right? So um, this is actually something that's in one of the lab sessions. Um, at one point in the, the lecture on the GPIO principles, I did mention briefly active low and active high. An active low input is one where the input port recognizes a zero as being a logic high and a, um, a one, so a high voltage, as being a logic zero. It it's reverses the sense of the input port. Just be careful of this. So we need an algorithm to scan the keyboard, and the algorithm is shown in the block diagram on the right hand side of this slide. And this is all in software, right? It's controlling the, the pins in the GPIO. It's just an example of the thing that I said in the previous um, uh, recorded video, in which we talk about how a, a GPIO port can be controlled in software to do different things. So when we do the keyboard scan, we configure the port and then we um, need to determine whether a key is pressed. So how do we do that? Well, we output 0, 0, 0, 1 binary, that's scanning row 1, and we quickly check uh, any of the three columns activated. If they are, it means buttons 1, 2, and 3 must be pressed, or either button 1, either button 2, or either button 3. If not, we output 0, 0, 1b, so we scan row 2, and we check the, f the three columns. If they're high, if any one of those is active, then it respectively means that pins four, five, or six are pressed. If not, then we scan row three, we're outputting zero, one, zero, zero, and we check again, and then we scan row four by outputting one, zero, 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 and we check again. And by doing this repeatedly, in an infinite loop, we can detect when somebody presses a button. Now, we're not saying this is very efficient because it's taking the entire CPU to do this. It's, in fact, the CPU is doing nothing except scanning this matrix all the time. But it works. Of course, if you are the user and you happen to press the button so quickly that it's um, not pressed when the CPU is trying to detect that button, then it won't work. But luckily, the CPU is very fast. There's an oscilloscope screenshot of, of this operating. Um, we can see the four rows signals on the oscilloscope, um, signals one, two, three, and four. And because this is active low, we can see that row one is active here, row two is active here, row three, sorry, row one is active here, 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 row two is active here, here, here. So row one, row two, row three, row four are being checked then row 1, row 2, row 3, row 4 are being checked again, repeatedly, over and over again. And if we look at the timing here, and we can see that the X scale is 200 microseconds per division, we can see that the way this is, is so quick that no human being could possibly press a button so quickly that they could be missed on this. In fact, it relies upon, as it says in the box on the right, the fact that the microcontroller can scan this much quicker than any human can possibly ever type. No matter how fast your typing is, you can't out-type this microcontroller. Now, I also mentioned bouncing, and this is because of the mechanical contacts in a switch. I said that there's two metal contacts. When you press a button, these metal contacts close together. But in the terms of how fast a microprocessor works, they are far apart, then they're close together, but in between, they just minuscule distance apart and the voltage starts to swing. So we can see the, the bounce on the, the upper right hand side of the slide here where a switch is pressed, the um, VDD is high, so according to this when the switch is, um, is not pressed the resistor will pull up the GPIO input to VDD, so the GPIO input is VDD. When the switch is pressed then the input starts to toggle rapidly and eventually the input GPIO pin is low. But in that short bouncing time, the thing rapidly oscillates. When the human being releases that switch, 
it goes from being zero and then it rapidly oscillates and goes up to being a high. If we are using our microprocessor to read the switch input and we happen to read the switch input at the wrong time, we're going to get a wrong signal here. It might be that the button's pressed, but we read it as, a, as showing the button is not pressed and vice versa. The CPU doesn't know that there's some mechanical problem here. We need to write some software to handle this. Well, not true. We could buy a very expensive keyboard and put capacitors and all sorts of active things in there to handle the problem, but it's expensive. So let's look at the software. What we basically do, the most uh, basic, simple solution is just to read the pin and then wait a little bit longer, wait longer than any debounce can possibly last, and then read it again just to be doubly sure. And in this um, example code here for the MSP430, um, we're waiting about 75 milliseconds. Um, we don't really know anything about how this CPU works, but we can just um, follow through. Ignore the first line here, this is watchdog controller. Um, it's to stop the CPU inadvertently resetting as we do some testing. We're sending port 1 direction register so that uh, pin 0, that's the 1 here, is set as an input. And port 1 direction register here is setting pin um, 1 here as an output. It's an LED, we're turning the LED off, but what we're really looking at is the input here. So if the input port bit 0 is 0, i.e. if this is active high, so if this is active and it's, uh, uh, it's active low, then we wait for 75 milliseconds and then we just check, is it really active? If it is, then we turn the LED on and we wait for the pin to um, no longer be active. So we wait while it's active until we can release the pin. It's very basic, very simple. We just read the pin, read the port. If it shows that the button is pressed, then wait 75 milliseconds and read it again just to check that it's really pressed. Thank you for your attention. Uh, let's see how you get on actually trying this in practice um, with a real microprocessor.